Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today's video is going to be a Manchester themed Q&A. I decided to make this video because I know a lot of you subscribed to me are starting first year at Manchester. So I just wanted to give you the chance to ask any questions. I know I had a lot of questions when I was first starting university and I didn't really have many people to ask before I started university. So hopefully I can be that person for you. I also get loads of questions privately in my DM. So I thought why not just make a video so I can answer these questions on a larger scale and they can help more than one person. This is definitely going to be a long video because I got way more questions than I was expecting to get. I have got a few questions that are not directly related to Manchester, some general questions about studying and things like that. I'm going to save those for the very end because I want this video to mainly be a Manchester specific Q&A for anyone who's starting medicine at Manchester. So yeah, it's going to be a long video, but it's definitely going to be worth it. I'm pretty sure after you watch this video, you'll know everything you could possibly need to before starting. If you haven't submitted a question and you want to in the future, the majority of my Q&As I put up on my Instagram story. So if you want to participate for next time, make sure to follow me on there because that's where I will mainly ask you to submit the questions. Okay, so the first question is, um, I'm going to keep all of the questions anonymous as well. So in the future, if you want to ask anything, don't worry, you can ask without your name being shown on the screen. Um, so the first question is, is it true that the cutoff for the UCAT score may change from year to year? Yes, the cutoff score for the UCAT does change every year. As far as I know, the cutoff for Manchester is the top three deciles, which means the top 30% of everyone taking the exam that year. How well each cohort does changes from year to year. So in the same way, the cutoff for each year will change from year to year as well. So the next question is, how do you know how much to study in PBL? Are you given any guidance? So with PBL, it does take a little while to grasp how much you're meant to study and how much detail you are supposed to go into. It's definitely really independent and you can definitely do not enough or go overboard and do way too much. So the way PBL works is you're given a case on usually the Monday and then you have the week to do all of your research, all of your learning and studying on that topic. And then usually on a Friday, you'll come together as a group and all discuss the case. It's usually a one and a half to two hour session where you sit down and discuss the case and discuss what what you've all learned that week. I think once you've been through that process a couple of times when you sit there and discuss everything that your peers have done, when you have those discussions, it will become more and more clear whether or not you've done enough or whether you've done too much based on the detail of the discussion that's taking place, if that makes sense. So obviously, if people are talking about things that you haven't come across and you don't know, then it means you've probably not done enough. But if you're kind of the one that knows the tiniest, tiniest details and um, the tutor doesn't seem to be mentioning them or no one else in the group has um, studied to that depth, then it's probably a little bit too deep. It is really weird though. I know that's not, not the best answer. It is really weird because it does take a while for you to understand that. And in some cases, some of the conditions you will need to go in more depth in and others will be a little bit more superficial. So it, it does really come with time. In terms of guidance, the supervisor is given a sheet or a booklet of a brief and like a criteria of what the medical school wants to make sure the PBL group has done and covered. So the supervisors do use that. And if there's a certain aspect of the condition that you guys haven't mentioned yet in your PBL group, the supervisor will kind of nudge you a little bit and say, well, what about this? Um, do you want to discuss this a little bit? Did anyone do any researching on this? This supervisor brief, though, the students aren't allowed to look at. Um, what the students do get given online, on the online portal that you'll be given access to is ILOs, which are intended learning outcomes. These can vary in number week to week. I'd say there are between 10 to 15 bullet points that the medical school wants to make sure you've looked into and done for that week. I actually didn't even know about intended learning outcomes for a good majority of my first year, so I really had no idea how much detail to go into, but uh, when I found out about them, it was a lot easier to see what the medical school is expecting you to cover. So yeah, don't worry about it. It will come with time. It is a very different method of studying to anything that you've ever done before, but you will be given a guidance and a framework to work with. And week on week, when you're having those discussions in your group, you will definitely be able to gauge how much you're meant to be doing. The next question is another PBL based question. And that was, what was your experience with PBL? Did you like it? I quite liked PBL. I know I've talked about this in a previous video as well, but I think it's a really nice way to study. It's obviously 
very similar to how you'd be studying as a doctor so I think at Manchester they really put you in the habit of doing independent learning from day one. I really really liked our PBL groups so on the Monday and the Friday you would meet with your PBL group which is around 10 to 12 people and I really really enjoyed the brainstorming behind it when you get given a case and you discuss it and then when you met up on the Friday and discussed everything that you've learned over the week I really enjoyed that. The interaction that you have in PBL with your group definitely makes it easier for information to stick in your head because if you're talking about a topic it just sticks in your head a different way than if you were just sitting silently in a lecture. We do still have lectures though, we have around five to six a week in the first year. So there were some times where I was a bit thrown off when I'd come into the group and people were talking about things that I hadn't done because I hadn't seen the ILOs, but I didn't ever feel like it was too independent. Like I definitely don't think the independent learning that they ask from you in PBL is anything beyond your capabilities. Overall, I really enjoyed PBL. I really miss it even now. The next question is also study related and that is how much studying should you do in first year. So in first year, if you mean kind of the PBL and how much studying you should do for your PBL sessions, then hopefully I've already answered that part of the question. But if you're just talking about in general how much studying you should do, I would definitely say don't stress out too much in your first year and even your second year. Do try and enjoy the fact that you've moved to university. It's a new chapter of your life definitely still participate in all of the extracurricular activities, join societies, freshers, do all of that fun stuff as well. I definitely don't think you should spend your entire first year sat at a desk studying 24-7. Your first and second year you obviously do have to pass to get into your next years but um, just remember at Manchester they don't count towards your final ranking or performance as um, a junior doctor which in some universities they do but in Manchester your first and second years count towards progression you need to pass to progress to the next year but they don't play any part whatsoever in how you'll be ranked at the end of medical school for your junior doctor jobs. So I'd say do enough to pass your exams and obviously I would encourage you to do well in your exams but I would say don't get too bogged down. Make sure you do all of the fun stuff as well and enjoy the fact that you've you're in your first year of university. This is the easiest it's going to be in medical school, so just enjoy that. So similar question again is on workload. So what is the workload like? I've heard it's really hard and I'm excited but scared. Okay, so the workload is a lot. I'm not going to lie about that. The content is insane. There's a lot of stuff that you have to know. But what I will say is I've always thought about it like this. If you're a medical student, if you've been accepted into medical school, like if you're clever enough to be in that position where you've got a place for medical school, honestly, it's not something that's not doable, if that makes sense. There is a lot of content and it is a jump up from A-levels, but it's just the same as A-levels was a jump up from GCSEs. It is a jump up in how much work you have to do, but you've also progressed in the way that you would have progressed from GCSE to A-level. You've also progressed as a person, as a student, and especially in your first and second years, it is a lot, but it's nothing that you're not capable of doing. So honestly, please don't be scared. And if you, at any point you do feel overwhelmed or burnt out, there is a lot of support available within the medical school. So the next question is, is the environment very competitive? So if I had to respond with a yes or no, I would say no. The vast majority of people that I've met at my medical school are really lovely and because of the nature of the profession you'll find that the majority of us are really friendly, really empathetic. I have had the odd few negative experiences. I have had experiences where another medical student I'm working with is really competitive but after four years of being at the biggest medical school in the UK it would have been weird if I didn't. Overall is the environment competitive at Manchester? No it's definitely not. Does that mean you'll never come across anyone being competitive at Manchester? No but it's definitely not anywhere near the stories I hear um, about some of the more competitive places like in London or even in the US. At Manchester we definitely don't have um, competitiveness to that level. Next question is how much clinical experience do you get in the first year? So first and second years are your preclinical years which means kind of what it says on the tin is before you start your clinical placements. I can't quite remember just how frequent the clinical placements were but you did have some in first and second year. So you have GP visits which um, they start off as half days and then towards the end of the year I think they turn into full days but that's just like one day every four or five weeks and then you also have hospital visits as well which again are 
not that frequent, about once it, once every month, once every couple of months. In your first year as well, your GP visit is in pairs, but your hospital visit is usually with your entire PBL group. So your whole group goes to the hospital for a day together or for half a day together. You're not really individually just put out there. In first year, all you're really expected to do is you'll be taught in your communication skills sessions how to just gather information from a patient. You're not taking a proper history. You're not um, diagnosing them or anything in your first year. You're just made to become more familiar in how to ask questions, how to communicate well. And then when you go to your hospital visit, I remember we were just split into smaller groups and each of the groups of two or three just went to speak to a patient and just ask some information about their hospital stay, about why they're in, about um, home life, support, things like that. You're not really meant to be doing anything more than that. The GP placements are more observational than the hospital ones, so don't be surprised if in your GP days or your GP half days you're just sat there in the corner just watching the GP do his job. As you learn more skills in your clinical skills sessions, you get more and more time to go and practice them during your hospital visits. Okay, so the next question is a big one and that is, what are the exams like? So, um, let me think of a clear way to break this down. So in your preclinical years, you have three types of exams. You have semester tests, you have progress tests, and you have your OSCE. So um, starting off with your semester tests, in first and second year, your semester tests are the main exams that you have to pass in order to progress to the next semester. So there are two semesters in every year, semester one and semester two, and then in second year, it's semester three and semester four. And at the end of each of these semesters, once in December and once in the summer, so May or June, you'll have your semester test. And in your preclinical years, these semester tests are based on the PBL content you've been learning. It's really important for these semester tests that you do go through all of your lectures. I know some people in PBL like to do their own research and not use the lectures that the tutors have given that week, but I'd really recommend definitely going through them because some questions on the semester tests are literally directly taken from those lectures. And sometimes in the semester tests, they do have very niche information that a lecturer would have given you uh, one week. And if you miss that lecture, you wouldn't really know how to answer that question because it's really quite specific. So definitely make sure to watch all of your lectures. It's really important for the semester test. And like I said, the semester test consists of the PBL stuff you've been going through and it will also have questions from the anatomy sessions that you've been doing in that semester as well. So the next type of test you have is your OSCE in first and second year. So first and second year OSCEs are very different to clinical years OSCEs. In your first year you only have an OSCE in the summer so you don't have one in December. In your second year you kind of only have one OSCE as well but the stations are split so you have half of the stations in December Jan time and you have half in summer. So for example, if there's 10 stations in the OSCE, you'll have five of them in the winter and five of them in the summer, if no changes have been made since I was in my preclinical years. Stations on these OSCEs will be things like um, how to measure blood pressure or asking you to measure the blood pressure of a patient, asking you to find a patient's pulse, asking you to talk to a patient and just gather some information from them. Again, not diagnosing them, but just gathering information about their stay, what, um, what's been going on with them, if they have any support with them, so things like that. And then in your first and second year OSCEs, you also have anatomy questions where they take you into the anatomy labs and they basically ask you questions about prosections. You'll definitely be given a lot more guidance on this um, prior to your OSCE time. They also always do BLS, so um, basic life support, CPR, things like that in the first and second year OSCEs. Obviously in your first year, the OSCE will be slightly easier. In second year, it'll be slightly harder, but in both first and second year, they're not like your clinical years OSCEs. So that's the second type of exam you have in your preclinical years. And then the third type of exam is the progress test. So the progress test is basically one exam that is sat twice a year, every single year, and everyone, whether you're in first year, second year, third year, fourth year, or fifth year, you all sit the exact same exam. So basically it means in your first year, when you start in January, you'll have a progress test, which is basically at the level of the exam that the fifth years are giving. And the purpose of this test is just to assess how much you're progressing. In your first year, when you look at that exam, it will just 
make absolutely no sense whatsoever. Pretty much everyone fails it the first time round and it would be weird if you didn't because you're not meant to know anything on it. But the medical school just wants to show that you're progressing in your knowledge. When I first sat it in my first year, none of it made sense. But it's really fascinating to see that once you do start to progress further and further in medical school, the questions just start to make sense. So I know in your first and second year, you, you'll just feel like, why, why am I even doing this? But when you get into those later clinical years, it's actually really weird to see how you slowly start to know the answers to the questions that at one point just seemed like gibberish. In years three, four and five, you only have the progress test and the OSCEs, so you don't have semester tests anymore. So you have the progress test again twice a year in winter and summer. In third year, you only have an OSCE in the summer. The OSCEs in clinical years are obviously harder. They assess things like taking histories, examining patients, interpreting blood results, chest x-rays, ECGs, giving patients information about diagnoses, giving patients information about medication that they might need to take more things that you'd actually do in day-to-day -day life as a doctor rather than the first and second year OSCEs which were just checking your basic skills. Ooh, so that was a really long explanation but I hope that makes it a bit clearer. I hope I broke it down in a way that was easy to understand. Okay so lots of questions about base hospitals. Um, the next question is out of the four base hospitals, which is the best for clinical years? Honestly, I'd say the differences between each of the base hospitals are very minor. You are definitely not going to be disadvantaged being put at one base hospital over another. So there are four base hospitals associated with the university. Those are the MRI, Withenshaw, Salford and Preston. And each of these are very modern hospitals, very advanced in their technology, very fast paced, very diverse in the patients that are seen. So so it would really be wrong to say that one is better than another. I think all of them will give you a very good clinical experience. Things to also consider is that being allocated to a base hospital doesn't mean that you're going to be there for your entire placement. You're allocated to that hospital, but also to all of the smaller hospitals around that hospital in the area. So even two medical students at the same base hospital can have two completely different experiences based on which of the sub-hospitals they've been put at. And these change around, so you're not going to be at the same site for an entire year you switch around every block. So for example, even if someone was to say that, oh, Salford is the best hospital to be placed at, two people being allocated Salford as a base hospital doesn't guarantee them both having a great experience. It really, really differs. I have heard students say that being placed at MRI or Salford is um, not the best because it's really busy and the doctors don't have that much time to teach you. And I've also heard people say that at Preston, you get a really good experience because there is a higher doctor to student ratio over there. So you get more attention from the doctors and get more teaching. But again, in my experience, I think the differences are quite minor. And I don't think you'd be disadvantaged if you were allocated to MRI or Salford because what may have been true for another student's experience may not be the same for yours. And again, remember, even if you're at MRI or Salford and they are busy hospitals, you're not spending your entire time there anyway. You're, you are going to be going to the smaller hospitals around that area as well. The next question is, when do you find out what your base hospital is? I'm not sure if it's changed since I was in my first year, but when I was in first year, you did find out in your first year. So we started medical school in September and we were given our base hospitals in December. So we know a whole two years before we move that we are going to be going there for our clinical years. Another base hospital question, can we choose base hospitals? No, you cannot choose your base hospital. Otherwise it would be very difficult to manage every student's request of which base hospital they want to go to. You can, however, give a preference if you have mitigating circumstances. So this includes things like any disabilities, any health conditions that mean that you have to stay in a particular area. And also living at home does count as mitigating circumstances for your base hospital. So if you live at home, you can give a preference for your base hospital. Again, this is just going to be a preference. The vast majority of people that do apply for mitigating circumstances do get the base hospital that they want. The next question is, which iPad do you get in third year? So this changes from year to year. There's no specific iPad they give you. We got uh, the iPad mini 5. I think, which is what I'm using to read the questions off at the moment. Some people don't get the mini, some people get the full-sized one. It just depends on your year. I quite like this one because it 
it uh, fits really nicely into the pocket of our scrubs. So yeah, it's usually the latest one, but we don't know which size or exactly which one we're being given until we get given it. The next question is how are placements? Are there a lot of students shadowing per consultant? In my experience, no, there haven't been that many students shadowing per consultant. The most number of students I've had go on a ward round with a doctor is like three. That may be due to COVID. I started my clinical placements after the pandemic. I know before COVID, they may have allowed um, slightly bigger groups to go around with a single doctor. The next question is, what is the schedule like? Is it very packed? So if you're just starting medical school now, so in September, the majority of your days in first year are half days. You'll have quite a few half days in your first year and second year. Even in clinical years as well, a lot of the days are half days rather than full days. But the thing that makes your schedule a little bit more packed in your clinical years is that you have to go and do like the clinical ward based stuff and also go home and study so on days where you've had a half day uh, if you count in all of the studying you have to do at home that just turns into a full day anyway and then when you do have full days you basically have to come home and um do more than a full day if that makes sense so in clinical years it does start to get a little bit more packed for time but in first and second year at least in first year definitely the timetable is quite chilled from what i can remember don't come after me if it's not like that anymore so next is how are we assessed and are there criteria for intercalation later on in the course and um, so how are we assessed i hope i've already answered that question with all uh, the details i went into about the exams are there criteria for uh, intercalation as far as I'm aware, no. Every medical student has the opportunity to intercalate if they want to. I think you have to have finished your second year and for some courses, you have to have done your third year. But apart from that, I don't think there are any other criteria. All medical students are eligible to intercalate if they want to. Also, our students allowed to intercalate externally yes you are allowed to intercalate um, at a university other than the university of manchester but only if the university of manchester doesn't offer that course that you want to intercalate in or it doesn't offer something very similar to that next which opportunities exist for research as well okay so research opportunities so at manchester from the very first year you do have mandatory research blocks that are put into the curriculum so you get um, designated time to do research on a topic that you are interested in and want to know more about so the time that you're given in these blocks is really helpful because it gives you the opportunity to do something outside of like clinical medicine and it gives you the opportunity to meet tutors who are willing to let you participate in research that may be published but apart from that i think if you you're really interested in research and uh, that's something you want to do and you want to publish lots of papers and stuff you do have to be quite proactive yourself as well so you can definitely be involved in a lot more research than just the course allows you to if you uh, for example have a doctor who's supervising you on a specific block and their area of medicine is something that you're really interested in doing research in then um, obviously it would be up to you to approach that tutor, approach that doctor and ask them if there are any opportunities for you to work with them on a specific research project. So yes, you have to be involved in mandatory research um, during the course, but if you're really, really passionate about doing research, then I'd say be proactive and try to ask for opportunities yourself and don't just wait for um, the medical school to give you that chance. The next question is, what are anatomy sessions like? Um, I could do literally an entire video just on anatomy sessions because they are so different to anything you've ever done before um, and there's a lot to talk about if that's something that you're interested in. Anatomy sessions I found quite fun, they're very interactive, for example pointing to different prosections and asking you to name the muscle or name the nerve. They can be quite intense because there's a lot of terminology around anatomy. Anatomy can also sometimes be a bit like PBL and that you don't know how much depth to go into because there is literally an infinite amount of information you could know about human anatomy. There is so much to it. The advice that I'd give for anatomy sessions is to definitely make sure you've done the Work before you go to your anatomy sessions please ignore my um, boiler but if you haven't done the work for your anatomy sessions then that hour that you spend in your anatomy is going to be really long for you nothing is going to make sense and it's just going to be a bit of a waste of time I have a video on my channel where I go into a huge amount of detail in exactly the process that I used to use to study for and revise for my anatomy sessions every single week I'd really recommend watching that for some more guidance on how you should uh, study for anatomy but again don't 
worry about it too much. Everyone's going to be in the same boat and the anatomy tutors are really helpful. It's just one of those things that takes a little bit of time to grasp how to learn it. So the next question someone has submitted privately, um, it's quite a long one, so they have DM'd it to me. Hi Hiba, I'm reaching out just to get some insight into what you think some medical school essentials are. I'm still worried about starting my first year at the University of Manchester. I have things like a MacBook and stationery sorted. I'll still need to buy some binders and writing pads. Aside from this, is there anything else you think I'll need? Um, so that's the first part of the question. And then I'm aware I can access most textbooks for free online. Is there anything else I'll definitely need as a first year student or any particular books I should borrow from the library at the start of the year before they're gone? Okay. So, so you've got your MacBook, you've got your stationery, and you're going to buy some binders and writing pads. Um, to be honest, apart from that, all you need is some pens. Honestly, you'd be surprised how little you actually need in terms of stationery. When I was starting medical school, I went all out and bought loads and loads of different um, stationery and resources and like study supplies and stuff. And I didn't really use the majority of them. You'll find that a lot of the time you'll be making notes on your laptop or iPad because it's just a lot quicker to make your notes on there. Apart from this, you say you're going to have your writing pads, which you can use to do like rough PBL notes and also uh, do any anatomy diagrams, things like that. And then your binders. Um, I did use those big files binders quite a lot. I used to organize any handwritten notes and put dividers for PBL1, PBL2, PBL3 for each PBL week. Apart from that, I actually don't think you, you do need anything else. In terms of the textbooks um, and borrowing books from the library before they're gone, Honestly, I just wouldn't recommend it. Pretty much every single book, as you've already mentioned, you can get online, either for free or you can access it online through the university's library as well. A textbook I would recommend for anatomy is Snell's Clinical Anatomy by Regions. It's also the one that the medical school recommends as well. I remember being recommended that in my first ever anatomy session, in my first week of medical school, and we were told that those go from the library really quickly. So me and my friend Hamad, after our first ever anatomy session, went straight to the library to go and get the book and literally like the next day we both went and just returned it because it was just so heavy to carry um so inconvenient as well because we we just found the pdf version online so i personally didn't use any physical textbooks if that's something that you feel like you want to then obviously you can but for me it was just inconvenient carrying um huge textbooks around when i can just have them on my ipad or my laptop so the next question i'm an international student um i'm a bit nervous about making friends any advice please don't be nervous everyone at manchester is really really nice and well Welcoming. We have a huge, huge community of international students. Um, literally, no matter which country you're from, there's probably a society for that country. And there are societies for international students in general. With that being said, I don't think I've ever felt like the international students were ever differentiated from home students. Everyone is really friendly and welcoming um, and no one will make you feel any different to students who are from the UK. As I mentioned, Manchester is the biggest medical school in the whole of the UK. So you will definitely find um, people that you get along with and and, um, you'll definitely find friends so please don't worry about that. The next question is what is the accommodation like? I know I've made a video on accommodation in Manchester and that was to give potential students that want to come to Manchester an idea of how much it would cost to live in Manchester. In terms of like the smaller details of accommodation, things like the quality of the catering, the cleanliness, the bathrooms, the kitchens, things like that, um, I'm not actually able to give further information on because I um, actually lived at home for my first two years of medical school and I moved into private accommodation in my third year so the flat that I'm in right now is not kind of student accommodation and I haven't actually lived in the university halls at Manchester so unfortunately I wouldn't be able to give any more details on that. I do apologize and I know it's a bit confusing because I did the accommodation video but that was just talking about cost alone based on the information from um, the University of Manchester official website. Website. So that is all of the University of Manchester specific questions. The next few questions that people have asked are um, things they've asked directly to me. One question asked by my friend Jill is what specialty are you interested in? I've talked about this on my channel before in my last Q&A. At the moment I'm very undecided. I literally have no idea at this point. Um, I feel like at this moment in time I'm even less decided um, than I was the last time that I answered this question. I think last time I talked about how I was wanting to do a bit of everything and that I had ruled out certain specialties. At the moment, I still want to do something quite general and be able to see lots of different conditions on a daily basis rather than um, focusing on a specific part of the body. So that's still how I'm feeling. However, 
I'm less opposed to surgery now than I was before, which has just made things um, a lot more complicated because going forward, if that is something I want to pursue, it's going to be a lot of pre preparation um, to even get to be given the opportunity to start training as a surgeon. One thing that I have definitely ruled out is dermatology. So that's where I'm at at this point. Um, my head is very scrambled. Hopefully when I've done some jobs as a junior doctor, it'll make things a bit clearer. The next question is hardest thing about fourth year. Fourth year just in general was very, very hard. Um, one thing I wanted to say about the workload that I didn't say earlier is that the hardness of it comes from the breadth of knowledge that you're meant to have, not because the things that you're learning are difficult to understand. And I definitely felt that in fourth year. Across our entire fourth year, I think we had to learn about more than 200 different conditions which could all come up on our exams and I really struggled with the amount of content. Again I did make it to the other side so please try not to be too scared um, and also things that contributed to me feeling that way were that firstly I started revising a lot later than I should have and secondly a lot of other stuff was going on at the same time in my fourth year so things like family and personal circumstances but also um, things like this YouTube channel um, I was uploading quite regularly and you'd be surprised at how many hours go into making a single video so my attention was definitely divided and that did definitely contribute next question what can i do to be prepared for medicine i'm not sure this would depend on like what point of your um journey you're at if that makes sense like are you in your doing your gcses are you are you currently doing a levels assuming that you do already have your place and you're asking this question in terms of uh, preparation for starting medical school i'd say watch medical school essentials videos i have one on my channel but loads of other youtubers have made really helpful videos as well that will give you a really good idea of the things that you need before you go into medical school apart from that i'd just say enjoy your summer don't overthink it no matter how much you try to prepare yourself there is always going to be a transition and settling in will only come with the experience that you have in your first few weeks of medical school my friend christina has asked a question what's been your favorite year so far christina actually also makes youtube videos if you haven't seen her on my channel already i did do a collaboration with her specifically about the differences between medical school at Manchester and medical school in Newcastle. I think my favourite year so far was third year. I really enjoyed being in hospitals in third year. I really enjoyed doing like the more hands-on stuff rather than just um, studying in first and second year but it's not as intense in fourth and fifth year so we were doing all of the fun clinical stuff without the pressure of fourth and fifth year. I also really loved my group in uh, third year. Um, Aya and Sana, you're probably not watching this, but if you are, um, I really enjoyed my third year with you guys. Do you ever regret your choice of going to Manchester? Not trying to be negative, just asking. It doesn't matter. I asked you to ask questions and you have asked a question, so that's okay. Do I ever regret going to Manchester? Absolutely not. I've said this in a couple of videos before, but Manchester wasn't my first choice and maybe that's why the question is being asked, but Manchester not being my first choice was solely, purely on the fact that I am from Manchester to begin with and I really wanted to experience moving to a new city. That was the only reason why Manchester wasn't my first choice really. Um, it definitely wasn't due to anything negative about the university. The next question is how to revise A level chemistry and biology I failed first year. I'm really sorry to hear that. It sounds like the study technique that you're using is probably not working for you at the moment. I think you should evaluate what study techniques you're using at the moment. What are you doing as your third A-level option? Are you doing well in that? Try to think about what you're doing differently in the subject that you're doing well in. I have a video on my channel on general A-level tips that you can use that might be a bit helpful. Um, in terms of the specifics of revising for biology and chemistry, I'm just going to keep this short because I do want this to be a Manchester Q&A video but if you send me a message privately on Instagram I can give you more guidance on uh, ways that you can try to revise. And the last question is from my friend Jaber who also makes YouTube videos. I'm so sorry like um, for all of my friends that have asked questions I haven't kept you anonymous I'm really sorry about that but he's asked the question how did it feel to be the most famous person in your class? Well it actually felt quite normal because pretty much no one knows in my university that I make YouTube videos. I'm definitely very 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 far from being famous. I know this is going to be a long video even post editing so thank you very much if you've watched all the way to the end. I hope this has been helpful for anyone starting medicine at Manchester. If you didn't get the opportunity to ask questions to be in the video this time please follow me on Instagram that's where I'll be posting stories for future Q&As. In the meantime if you do have a question that hasn't been answered you can leave it in the comments and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you so so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.